Hello, this discussion is going to cover Rousseau's excerpts from The Social Contract, which is another really difficult reading, and again, I appreciate your efforts to understand it. Uh, I'm going to go through not everything, but the major points, and then the points that you might want to discuss in your definition argument. So first of all, um, I wanted to cover each section a little bit and talk about what it means. So looking at this first introduction section, uh, Rousseau is basically saying why he is, what his purpose is and why he has this purpose to better understand um, the civil order, as he puts it. And so he says that he's not a politician, but he still feels a responsibility. And I have this highlighted in this portion right here. Um, he says, however feeble the influence my voice can have on public affairs, the right of voting on them makes it my duty to study them. And so this suggests that if we are going to have a vote, that we have a responsibility to understand what we're voting on. Moving on, uh, he has his first official section, uh, subject of the first book. And I've highlighted the quote that many students refer to in their discussions of Rousseau, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. And sometimes students think that this is his claim, but really it's his context. He is showing what is going on. And in Rousseau's opinion, we are born free subjects. We're, we're born of free will, but we are put in chains for various reasons. And he talks about the right of the strongest being one, which in its most extreme form is slavery, but in other ways is just being suppressed by someone who has their will exerted over us. So that's not his claim, but it is an important uh, quote that you may have touched on in your notes and in your discussion. Uh, and then he gives us a sense of what his claim is in this other highlighted portion that I have in this first section. And it says, the social order is a sacred right, which is the basis of all other rights. Nevertheless, this right does not come from nature and must therefore be founded on conventions. And so what this means is that the social order, the way we organize society and decide the way it'll run, is a sacred right. And it gives us our rights. Uh, so it doesn't come from nature which leads to right of the strongest to whoever can enforce their will being in charge, but is instead on our decisions about how to run our governments, uh, our societies. And he says that this must therefore be founded on conventions. Conventions are those rules or laws that we decide on as a group. And of course, at this time, uh, what Rousseau was, was writing about was particularly for men, and even landowning men had more privilege, but we have taken this and applied it to everyone. And our basis of our government is, is on this idea that we should agree, we should decide together how to run our country, um, or in other countries, their, their societies, uh, and that's where we get the social order. Okay. So that's what he's talking about. Uh, then he goes into the right of the strongest, and this is really to show uh, context, to show what's happened before, and to say that this is not actually how society should be based. Uh, and so he comes to this conclusion after his discussion, force does not create right, uh, and that we are obliged to obey only legitimate powers. And so what he's saying is that just because someone can conquer and rule by force, that does not mean that we have to obey them. We might choose to out of necessity, as he puts up above, or out of um, prudence, but that doesn't mean it's a moral right. Um, so this was referring to kings and conquerors, those who had um, power that was not given to them by the people, which would be the legitimate powers. Uh, slavery, this section is almost entirely cut, but uh, Rousseau did believe that slavery was not natural and argued that if anyone was enslaved, that that was because of force and because of that right of the strongest that was not a legitimate authority. 
And so um, that was really uh, way ahead of his time. Uh, and so he has, we have this quote here, since no man has a natural authority over his fellow and force creates no right, we must conclude that conventions form the basis of all legitimate authority among men. And so he's repeating what uh, his claim is here as he transitions um, from that section on slavery. And again, um, if you want to read it, you can, but the, the most important thing is he was disagreeing that some people should have natural authority, and that's why it leads back to his claim again. Okay, then we have this next section um, that we must always go back to a first convention, uh, and this is that sense that um, we have to go back to that sense that we all agree on how our society should be run on that social contract. Uh, and he questions majority rule uh, and says that, um, you know, if there were no prior convention, so we hadn't agreed that elections work this way, the minority would no, have no need to submit to the majority. Uh, and so what he's saying with this last quote is that we have decided that that's how we'll run and therefore that makes it right. It's not because the majority necessarily um, should just automatically have power, but we've decided that majority rule in voting is how we function. And that's what gives majority rule the authority that it has. So if you think of, for example, um, when we vote on a law, uh, you know, in, in the election, sometimes we vote on, on laws and we decide as a majority that we're, we want that law to go forth, it's because we've decided that's how it works that makes it right. Uh, and of course, we could debate that, and we'll especially see in Thoreau that there are some questions of the tyranny of the majority. Okay, moving on, uh, he gets into a social compact, and this is that social contract, the conventions on which society works. Uh, and this was an important section here on page three, um, quite a bit of important information. Uh, he writes, the problem is to find a form of association which will defend and protect with the whole common force the person and goods of each associate, and in which each, while uniting himself with all, may still obey himself alone and remain as free as before. This is the fundamental problem of which the social contract provides the solution. And so what this comes down to is the problem of how do we have individual liberties and have a society in which we work together and agree together on how it should work. Uh, and so he says that the social contract is what provides the solution. It's what allows us to have individual liberties and a functioning society. So going on, uh, he says that uh, these clauses properly understood may be reduced to one, the total alienation of each associate together with all his rights to the whole community. For in the first place, as each gives himself absolutely, the conditions are the same for all. And this being so, no one has any interest in making them burdensome to others. Uh, so what we have here is a little tricky. Sometimes students feel that what he's talking about is some kind of tyranny, that we don't have any rights ourselves because everything is about um, the majority and about that social contract. But what he's actually saying is that we will willingly give up our natural rights, and he goes on to talk about those natural rights. In other words, we would give up our right of the strongest, our right to dominate others, our right to do whatever we want, in order to have the protection of the whole of the community uh, and to have say in the community. And so we're all having input into how it should run and we're protected because of that. And we're also free because of that. And so it's, it's pretty complicated because, you know, we have our own feelings about how well we have our individual rights, whether we have those individual rights, within the society we have. So he's being very idealistic here uh, in terms of thinking about how this will work. And that's clear in the next paragraph. Uh, moreover, the alienation being without reserve, 
So in other words, with us being willing to do this without reserve, without any doubts, um, the union is as perfect as it can be, and no associate has anything more to demand. For if the individuals retained certain rights, as there would be no common superior to decide between them and the public, each, being one, on one point his own judge, would ask to be so on all. The state of nature would thus continue, and the association would necessarily become inoperative or tyrannical. So, in other words, if we were to say, no, this part of my rights is not part of the social contract, I want to reserve them separate from that, then it wouldn't work, um, or we would have tyranny. And then he says, finally, each man in giving himself to all gives himself to nobody, and as there is no associate over whom he does not acquire the same rights as he yields others over himself, he gains an equivalent for everything he loses and an increase of force for the preservation of what he has. Um, and so what this means is that by giving ourselves over to the social contract, we're not giving anything up because everyone's doing this equally. And so it's not like one person will have more rights over me than I have over them. We'll be in agreement to what our rights are. Again, very idealistic, assumes that everyone will fully engage in this as equals. If then we discard from the social compact what is not of its essence, we shall find that it reduces itself to the following terms. Each of us puts his person and all his power in common under the supreme direction of the general will, and in our corporate capacity we receive each member as an, in, as an indivisible part of the whole. Uh, going on, at once, in place of the individual personality of each contracting party, this act of association creates a moral and collective body, composed of as many members as the assembly contains votes, and receiving from this act its unity, its common identity, its life, and its will. The public person, so formed by the union of all other persons, formerly took the name of city, and now takes that of republic or body politic. It is called by its members state when passive, sovereign when active. Uh, so we belong to this state that we've created um, when it's active, when it's enforcing its laws that we've decided on, it's the sovereign. And power when compared with others like itself. So when we're looking, for example, at the United States, France, and so on, we're powers. Those who are associated in it take collectively the name of people, so we are the people, and severally are called citizens, as sharing in the sovereign power and subjects as being under the laws of the state. So notice that we're all these things. We're the people, we're the citizens, we're those who make these rules and are part of the social contract, but we're subjects because we're under these as well. Okay. So what this is describing, it's, like I said, very complex, but it's not describing a tyranny. It's not describing a state that has control over us and in which we have no say. It's supposed to be something that we willingly engage in and that protects us and that is part, acts on our will. Um, it's for us. Um, but at the same time, we have responsibility we can't do whatever we want because we're maintaining this republic. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, really what this comes down to is this is how our government was founded uh, as a republic with a constitution that we, according to this, agree upon, agree to follow, and that helps protect our individual liberties. And he'll get into that in a moment. Um, but first I want to talk about the sovereign because as we think about government, and how it can restrict us, we often think of the sovereign as this kind of scary, oppressive thing. And in the, the social contract, the sovereign is not that. Instead, it's what we have created that helps us maintain the social contract. It keeps it enforced um, so that no one takes power over us and takes this social contract away from us. Uh, and so if you're thinking about the sovereign, think about that. Okay. Um, so to clarify that, he talks about the sovereign being formed wholly of the individuals who compose it, neither has nor can have any interest contrary to theirs. 
So the government or the sovereign, according to Rousseau, would not of us. Instead, it's going to do our bidding. It's going to fulfill our will. And he ends this with the sovereign, merely by virtue of what it is, is always what it is, what it should be. Okay. Um, moving on here, it talks about the interests of individuals. And what he's saying here in these in these two paragraphs in paragraph or section seven is that while sometimes we may feel like we want something that we're not allowed to have based on our social contract, um, that we may have those interests, but they wouldn't serve us well. Um, that our best option is to be part of the social contract instead of trying to maintain our natural rights, such as right of the strongest, because we're going to be better off with it. Um, not just protected, but also morally. He believes that this is how we get moral reasoning by uh, fulfilling the social contract. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, when the general body or the, the body politic, the republic, forces us or makes us follow it, it's just doing so to protect us. Again, very idealistic. Um, and one thing that we're noticing, of course, is that he's not thinking about opposing views such as when the Republic gets away from the people as much, except for in this note at the end that I'll go ahead and jump down to, which says, under bad governments, this equality is only apparent and illusory. It serves only to keep the pauper in his poverty and the rich man in the position he has usurped. In fact, laws are always of use to those who possess and harmful to those who have nothing, from which it follows that the social state is advantageous to men only when all have something and none too much. Uh, and so the idea here is that if some take control of the sovereign, of the republic, um, and have more rights than others, it's not going to work. It's a corruption. And so... A lot of the problems that you may think of as criticisms of Rousseau are actually things that he would see as a problem as well. Okay, so jumping back up um, to the civil state, um, this is where he talks more about the moral improvement on individuals if they're part of this social contract. Uh, and um, it says that what he gains, and this is here in this in this section here, um, by being part of this is civil liberty and the proprietorship proprietorship of all he possesses. Uh, and so what that means is, rather than being able to do whatever we want, we have these civil liberties. So you can think of it, for example, as having First Amendment rights within our republic. Um, we have freedom of speech. While we might not be able to do whatever we want, we have that protected. And then as far as property, which he gets into in the next section, while we may not be able to claim whatever we want, for example, I can't come to your house and take your house, um, we have the protection of the sovereign of our property so that others can't take it from us. Okay. And again, this doesn't get into things that happen such as uh, civil asset forfeiture when the police or the government takes our property uh, and does so because they say that we've committed a crime or um, are traveling with too much money, those kinds of issues. So there are some opposing views that are important here, but he was thinking idealistically. Okay. Uh, so that gets into the real property uh, section as well. And then I want to end with this last quote. Uh, he writes, Instead of destroying natural, natural inequality, the fundamental compact substitutes for such physical inequality as nature may have set up between men. So he's saying that not all people are going to be exactly the same. Some people may have more strengths than others. But this creates an equality that is moral and legitimate, and that men who may be unequal in strength or intelligence become everyone equal by convention and legal right. In other words, it won't doesn't matter if you're stronger, you're smarter, you could con your way into more power. This is supposed to make it so that everyone has those same civil rights uh, and is protected. Okay. 
So hopefully that helps you understand Rousseau a little bit better. Again, there are a lot of concerns, a lot of opposing views about how this actually works. But what I really want to emphasize is that Rousseau is not arguing for tyranny. He's not arguing for us being under a government control that we have no say in. What he's saying is that we create it, uh, we create this republic, and then we're protected by it. We can live better lives because of it. Uh, and then he admits that this can become corrupted, but he doesn't spend a whole lot of time on that in that section that we've read. Okay. So thinking about your definition argument, you might be thinking about what it means to be free, and you might be thinking about, does this really work? Does Do we need the social contract for freedom? Do you feel that having our natural rights is necessary, is being free of any kind of collective or um, republic actually the way to be free? Or do you feel like this is necessary but maybe not working the way it should? Uh, so Rousseau might be helpful for you, uh, might not, depends on your views about his ideas and of what it means to be free. I hope this is helpful. Let me know if you have any questions.